A few weeks ago, we talked about John's view of the Antichrist, and we mentioned at that time that Arrhenius, a second century theologian who, was, uh, who grew up in the church at Ephesus, uh, talked about the Antichrist coming from the tribe of Dan. Well, since then, we found a lot more material, and Gary has written an article for our October edition of Prophecy in the News magazine. It's a fascinating article here. His title is, Will the Antichrist Be from the Tribe of Dan? Hmm. And J.R., this is a hotly contested question. Many people say, uh, for reasons which we'll discuss in a moment, that the Antichrist cannot be descended from the tribe of Dan. Uh, since Daniel speaks of his genealogy and it doesn't seem to have Dan in it. However, we have some new information. Uh, J.R., the thing that precipitated this whole discussion, brought it to our minds once again, uh, was uh, Arrhenius' view of Jeremiah 8.16. And Jeremiah 8 is a chapter devoted to the judgment of Judah. It has a latter-day uh, application. The 16th verse says, The snorting of his horses was heard from Dan. The whole land trembled at the sound of the neighing of his strong ones, for they are come and have devoured the land and all that is in it, the city and those that dwell therein. Well, Arrhenius uh, said, This is the Antichrist. Mm -hmm. And he further said that John left the tribe of Dan out of the list of the 144,000 from the 12 tribes in the book of the Revelation because, he said, John knew that Dan would produce the Antichrist. Well, John had a lot more to say about the Antichrist. In fact, the book of Revelation, even though he does not call him Antichrist in the book, the book is about the rise of the men of sin, the beast with the seven heads and ten horns, and the little horn with the mouth speaking great things, and the 666. Well, when Arrhenius comes to chapter 13 of the book of Revelation and verse 18, which uh, gives the number of the, of the uh, Antichrist as the number of the name of a man, 666 is his numerical value. Arrhenius really gets excited about this. And uh, uh, let me just mention to you that Arrhenius was born somewhere around uh, 120. Nobody knows exactly the date. Somewhere they've placed it between 115 and 135. But I, I suspect somewhere around 120, about 20 years or so after John dies. And um, uh, he grows up in the church at Ephesus and is the student of Polycarp. And Polycarp, the pastor of the church, the bishop of the church in Ephesus, was a student of John. So John the Revelator teaches Polycarp. Polycarp teaches Arrhenius. That we've, we mentioned that in our program on John's view of the Antichrist. But what we didn't know at the time is that that Arrhenius had a student, and his name was Hippolytus. And Hippolytus had some interesting things to say about Dan as well. Mm. And we're going to get to Hippolytus, but first, Jared, let's kind of flesh out the mystery a little bit. Uh, Daniel prophesies the Antichrist in Daniel 9.27, and uh, we're not going to spend a lot of time on this, but we should say that Daniel uh, talks about the genealogy of the Antichrist. He says, the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. That would be the temple in uh, A.D. 70. And, yes. and the people who came and destroyed the city and the sanctuary were Vespasian, his son, General Titus, and later the whole thing was uh, uh, sort of brought under uh, Roman jurisdiction by the Emperor Domitian. Now, these three men, Vespasian, Titus, and Domitian were called Flavians. They, they were the dynastic heads of the realm uh, of Rome that solidified the destruction of Jerusalem. And Daniel says in Daniel 9.27 that they were the progenitors of the Antichrist. Therefore, reading Daniel, it's common to say the Antichrist must be descended from Roman blood. That's that. He cannot be from the tribe of Dan because he's a Roman or descended from uh, the Flavian household. And that would be the end of the story, J.R., except for one thing. The Roman household may, in fact, have Danite blood in it. For the Bible says that Dan will be, is traceable prophetically to the latter days. Uh, Dan was a very special tribe, <coughs> uh, very special in several ways. First of all, 
when uh, the tribes entered the land, uh, the part of the land that the, uh, uh, the, the Danites got was contested land down by the Philistines uh, uh, off the shore of the Mediterranean inland between Jerusalem and the, the, the land of the Philistines. <clears throat> and Dan came down to that land and saw that it was going to take a, a rather severe and protracted fight in order to maintain possession of the land. And J.R., instead of being up for the fight, up for the battle, they said, mm, we're not sure we want to fight to save this land, and besides, it's too small for us, mm -hmm. and we need to go find some better land. And so, J.R., they, they did not take their possession the way they should have. They had 157,000 population in the tribe of Dan, the largest tribe in all the 12 tribes of Israel. Indeed. And when Benjamin, you recall in the, um, in the Bible, when uh, the tribe of Benjamin was practically wiped out because of the sin of Benjamin, um, the Bible says that the Danites, that the people of the south uh, rallied an army against the uh, tribe of Judah mm -hmm. and the Danites and dispossessed the Danites of what little territory they had in the first place. Indeed. So they had to move north. They moved north to Laish. And interesting, Gary, the name Laish means city of the lion. And it does. Now, uh, let's uh, camp on one more idea, and that is the very name Dan. Dan is uh, ex as an extension of the Hebrew word Dean, which means judgment. And there is a prophecy in Genesis 49 where Jacob calls his sons together. And he prophesies over Dan, saying, Dan shall judge his people. Dan's uh, prophesied uh, domain includes judgment. Mm -hmm. Dan shall judge his people as one of the tribes of Israel. Dan shall be a serpent by the way. Now that's, uh, you know, when you mention the serpent, that's a curse. Yes. Dan shall be a serpent by the way, an adder in the path that biteth the horse's heel so that his rider shall fall backward. So here we know that Dan uh, is uh, contested as one of the 12 tribes, maybe weak, maybe weary, uh, maybe going and looking for greener pastures, and furthermore, having this cloud over their head because Jacob prophesied that they were going to judge their people and be a serpent by the way. Mm -hmm. And Moses also gave a prophecy about the 12 tribes, and of Dan he said, Dan is a lion's whelp that shall leap from Bashan. Well, Gary, that's where they ended up, in the territory of Bashan, in the little city of Laish, called the city of the lions. That's so right. as a lion's whelp, they left from there, and they left by ship. And we are told in the Bible, in Deborah's song, that the Danites set offshore in their ships. That's right. And would not enter the <clears throat> battle. Gilead, uh, in Judges 5.17, Gilead abode beyond Jordan. And why did Dan remain in ships? Asher continued on the seashore and abode in his breaches. Well, J.R., this talks about Dan as a seafaring people. We know from this and from other references that they cast off uh, from the area of Laish. They worked their way over toward the Mediterranean and they went toward the west. Yes. As a matter of fact, they settled in Greece in uh, the peninsula called Peloponnesus. Mm -hmm. That's right. They became the Danians of Homer's Iliad. In the uh, territory of Lacedaemonia, and finally they changed their name to Spartans. Oh yes. There are two sources, both in the Apocrypha, in 1st Maccabees, and in the writings of Flavius Josephus, that the Spartans believed themselves to be kinsmen of the Jews, now, of the are, stock of Abraham, no less. Absolutely. The, the Spartans are legendary people. As a matter of fact, uh, when we think of Spartans, we think of fierce warriors, we think of the most independent people maybe in the history of the world. Uh, we think of the great Greek battles, we think of uh, how they distinguished themselves in battle, but do we ever think of them as being Greek Jews? Well, we don't. But <laughs> after this program today, I hope you'll begin to change your mind on that. Uh, Gary, 
uh, you've written this wonderful article on Dan and how he's going to produce the Antichrist. I found on, uh, on a program that I saw on television about the Danians mm -hmm. and the tombs of the royal kings in Mycenae. It's a little community about 30, 35 miles southwest of Athens in the heart of Lacedaemonia. And, you know, this uh, fellow Heinrich Schlem Schlemann, Schleman, uh -huh. Schleman uh, who found Troy back in the late 1800s, also dug up these tombs. And in them, he found Egyptian gold. He found uh, swords and uh, helmets and uh, things to make war. And it could well have been the instruments of war that were used in the Trojan fight against Troy. Mm -hmm. Because Agamemnon, uh, the king in Mycenae, gathered the Danians because they had ships. Yes. See, just like Deborah said, the right. ships of Dan. The Danians had ships, and Achilles uh, was uh, a part of these ships and these warriors. And so Agamemnon asked mm -hmm. Achilles to bring the ships of the, of the Danians and uh, uh, go together to fight this war against the Trojans because uh, Paris, a Trojan prince, had stolen Helen <laughs> yeah. and, and for himself, Helen of Troy, right. she was called. And so uh, when he dug up these um, tombs, they found some tombstones the Danian tombstones. We have pictures of them here in this magazine. And on one tombstone, you can see the water above and the water below going through the Red Sea. Here's an Egyptian chariot chasing Moses. And in this tombstone, you see the Egyptian falling out of his chariot as the horses revolt, as Moses turns around and brings the water down upon the Egyptians. That's the Danians. Now, JR, there are two things to interject rather quickly. <clears throat> the, the, uh, the Spartans, uh, AKA Danites, and we're going to show you the documentation for that in just a moment. The Spartans uh, began uh, to develop as a powerful people uh, before the reign of King David, maybe what, uh, 11, 1200 BC? At least. At least. Uh, and the, the battle at Troy was 1250. BC. And everybody thought that the Battle of Troy, J.R., was just mythology until Heinrich Schliemann came along and he said, no, I don't think this is mythology at all. I believe I can trace the uh, elements of the battle and find the tombs and the artifacts. And he did. He did. And suddenly it became history. And, and J.R., Lacedaemonia, that is the area in the southern Peloponnese then, uh, became very important geographically and hist historically because we now know that by about, ooh, what would it be? Maybe about 850 BC, uh, the Spartans had come to total control of the southern Peloponnese, and they were called Lacedaemonians because that was the name of the territory. Mm -hmm. So you have the Spartans slash Lacedaemonians being a nation and a people. And this is recorded in uh, the Apocrypha, it's recorded also by the historian Josephus. Mm -hmm. And we regard the Apocrypha as historic uh, material to be dealt with as history, uh, but not, it's not the canon of Scripture, so we don't regard it as divinely inspired. The First Maccabees 12 uh, talks about a letter that was sent from Arius, king of Sparta, to Onias, the high priest in Jerusalem. And part Part of it says this, I've got much, much more in the article, but part of it says this, quote, a document, and that would be a genealogy, has come to light which shows the Spartans and Jews are kinsmen, descended alike from Abraham. Well, he's writing basically to Jerusalem, uh, to uh, the uh, uh, high priest, and he's saying, why don't we develop a treaty between us? Why don't we have cordial relations? Josephus records this same letter as follows, <clears throat> with the following changes. Arius, king of the Lacedaemonians, now that's the geographical area, to Onias sendeth greeting. We have met with a certain writing whereby we have discovered that both Jews and Lacedaemonians are of one stock. 
So now we have two different sources for this letter. And as quoted by Josephus, the letter ends in this way. Uh, and it, this is a, uh, uh, shall we say, a validating uh, addendum to the letter. And it says, and I quote, this letter is four square. It's, it's, it's on a, probably a parchment or an animal skin, square. And the seal is an eagle with a dragon in its claws. In other words, it would be rolled up and sealed with sealing wax, and the seal would be an eagle with a dragon in his claws. Now, J.R., that puts mm -hmm. the stamp on it. Yes, the tribe of Dan had as its, on its flag a yeah. serpent. A serpent. That was what Jacob attributed to the tribe of Dan, the symbol of a serpent. <clears throat> However, mm -hmm. Ahaezer, the head of the tribe of Dan, refused to put a serpent on his flag when they, when they raised the tabernacle up in the center of the camp and every tribe had to put up their flag. Right. Uh, at that time, the tribe of Dan changed their symbol to an eagle. Uh, Gary, we've mentioned Arrhenius. Mm -hmm. His student was Hippolytus. Yes. And Hippolytus also grew up in Ephesus, just as Arrhenius did as a student of Polycarp, Polycarp did as a student of John, who was the bishop of Ephesus when he wrote the book of the Revelation. Here in the testimony of, of uh, Hippolytus, and I'll just read part of this because yes. you're right, we don't have time to read it all. He says, for Moses speaks thus, Dan is a lion's whelp and he shall leap from Bashan, uh, but that in no uh, that in, but that no one may err by supposing that this is said of the Savior, let him attend carefully to the matter. Dan, he said, is a lion's whelp. And in naming the tribe of Dan, he declared clearly the tribe from which the Antichrist is destined to spring. For as Christ springs from the tribe of Judah, so Antichrist is spring from the tribe of Dan. And then, of course, he went on to talk about Jacob uh, referring to Dan being a serpent lying upon the ground biting the horse's heels. Now, let's try to draw all this together into a, a, a neat little picture for you. And, and we mentioned in the beginning <coughs> that th there was a prophecy uh, of Dan, uh, the horses of Dan riding forth. Uh, we mentioned that Dan wandered from his original domain over into Greece, became known as the Spartans. Uh, J.R., the only thing that we need to do now is talk about the prophecy of Daniel in which he said that the Flavian household, that of Vespasian and Titus, mm -hmm. would be the household uh, that would give birth to the Antichrist. Well, let's go back then all the way to, uh, to uh, Alexander the Great yes. and talk about his connection with the Flavians. And Daniel chapter 11 deals with this, if you want to read the whole thing. It's devoted to Alexander the Great, mm -hmm. the great conqueror of the world. He came out of Greece and in 323, he died, and when he did, uh, all of his holdings were divided up into uh, four uh, general uh, areas of command, two of which, uh, uh, two of his generals uh, kind of faded off the, the, the scene, leaving Alexander's uh, 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 collective rule in the hands of Seleucus and Ptolemy. Seleucus and Ptolemy, J.R., are the, shall we say, the springboard out of which would come Antiochus IV Epiphanes, mentioned yes. in Daniel chapter 11 as the model of the Antichrist. Yes. These people are Greeks, and yet somehow they become the progenitors of the Antichrist. This must mean that they have, shall we say, Spartan blood or Danite blood in yes. their veins. And Ptolemy was the half-brother of Alexander. Yes. And when Ptolemy marries his daughters off to the Seleucus dynasty, the Seleucid dynasty, Antiochus then is part Ptolemy of the household of Alexander the Great, uh, on the side of their mother Olympias. And the fascinating thing is history tells us that Philip of Macedon suspected that Alexander was not his son. Mm. So he spied on Olympias, and one day he found a serpent in her bed, went to the oracle and asked them, what does this mean? They said, this is the god Zeus Amun, this serpent. Mm. And then Olympias comes to Alexander and confides in him, your father is not really Philip. You are the son of the god Amun. You see, Alexander was of serpent 
seed of the serpent mm -hmm. blood. Isn't that fascinating? It, it really is. This means then that that blood, the blood of Dan, flowed in the veins of Ptolemy and Seleucus. What's important about them is that they later on became very, very close with the uh, leaders, uh, the Caesars, the leaders of the Roman Empire during the days of Jesus and the apostles. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the Seleucid dynasty came into control of Syria. Uh, and the household of Syria and all the dynastic rulers of Syria were very close to the Caesars. They even intermarried J.R. And it's, this is a matter of historical record. We don't have time to talk about all the marriages. The Ptolemies, uh, meanwhile, down in Egypt and around the southern part of the Mediterranean, also intermarried with the royal houses of Rome. Again, this would be Danite blood intermarrying with the royal houses of Rome. Everybody's heard of Antony and Cleopatra. Uh, yes. Cleopatra was not only a Ptolemy, she was a Seleucid, bringing this blood line into the houses, the royal houses of Rome, out of which came the Flavian dynasty ultimately, Vespasian, Titus, the destruction of the temple. And Dan, Daniel clearly says that these would be the fathers of the Antichrist, and we know that they have Danite blood. So it's not possible then to exclude Dan from the progeny or the uh, genealogy of the uh, Antichrist. Yes, and you've got to understand we're not just talking about Italians here, we're talking about all of European royalty because over the centuries uh, came Merovi in the fifth century. That's right. Who was uh, offspring of these uh, Trojan princes. In fact, uh, he claimed to be a Trojan. You know, the city of Paris is a Trojan uh, name. And the city of Troy, France, it yes. comes from the old Trojan Empire. And uh, so all of European royalty are suspect here. Absolutely. And, and in our studies, we're in the months ahead, we're going to flesh this thing out. It's awesome. Now, I realize we're flooding you with a lot of information. You can read about it in the Prophecy in the News. I want to quit to hear on one high note. Deuteronomy 33:22, Dan and of Dan he said, Dan is a lion's whelp, he shall leap from Bashan. This is Moses talking. Bashan is the territory of Syria. Syria was the home of the Seleucid rulers. Antiochus IV Epiphanes came out of Bashan, mm -hmm. if you will. Uh, this is, to me, a, a very clear prophecy that Dan is going to leap from the bloodline of the Seleucid dynasty through the houses of Rome and into the future. Yes. This is J.R. Church and Gary Stearman. Until next time, keep looking up.